Um, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, as the case may be. I am Madan Rehani, President IOMP, and I wish to first congratulate all of you for successfully passing through the difficult year 2020. And I wish you and your loved one safe time in this year. Thank you for joining this webinar. This is the first webinar of this year and I see the enthusiasm shown by you. We have large number of participants still joining every second. And this webinar is on radiation safety culture. We have been calling this team as dream team of the four organizations, which has been working for five plus years. And everyone has contributed equally. There is no one who should be first or second or third. So to maintain that equality and contribution we decided to have the presentation in alphabetical order in terms of the name of the organization. Even if content wise, it could be better in some other order. Uh, some logistic points. We will encourage your questions through the chat box. You can add your questions there but we will look at the questions and attend to that when all the presentations are over. Normally in the chat, we always encounter a question of the availability of the recorded webinar. And yes, we make the webinar available on the IUMP website and all previous webinars are available there. This also will be made available. Another logistic announcement, we do not award any certificate of participation or for CME. So this is for educational activity. With that, let me start with the program and let me first share the screen. Just a minute. All right. So we have the first presentation by the IAA, Dr. Debbie Gilly will be making the presentation. Debbie is a radiation protection specialist with IAA in the radiation protection of patients unit. She has been involved in the development and implementation of the SAFRON program, which is safety in radiation oncology medical event reporting system. She has been assisting in IAA patient protection and safety campaigns also supporting the countries in radiation protection of patient activities. She, country, she is a contributing author of several IAA publication on patient safety and has contributed a chapter on, on the modern technology of radiation oncology and radiation therapy in cancer care facing the global challenge. Earlier she was the government relations specialist with American Association of Physicists in Medicine. And prior to that, for 24 years, she had been working in Florida Bureau of Radiation Control in US as manager of the timing and quality assurance program and manager of the radioactive material program. With these few words, I will pass on the control to Debbie to start her presentation. And there you go, Debbie. Okay, Debbie, you have the control.
you have to unmute I don't have this. Uh, there we go. Good afternoon. I'm trying to do this on an iPad, so let's see how it goes. Uh, I am Debbie Gilly. I am a radiation protection specialist for the IAEA, and I've been charged with the responsibility of developing safety culture training uh, through for uh, radiation safety culture training in medicine. The objectives of this presentation are to provide participants with information on the importance of safety culture and quality in radiation technologies used in medicine, provide information on the development of the training material using a novel approach to stakeholder participation, and provide some information on the training material and how it can be used to facilitate, improve knowledge and change of behavior, improving radiation safety culture. So why is this important to the International Atomic Energy Agency and our international basic safety standards were very uh, strong statements about safety culture and the importance of safety culture in any nuclear and radiation technology that is used. In fact, it comes up very early in our safety standards and it's considered the principal party shall promote and maintain safety culture by promoting both individual and collective commitment to protection and safety at all levels of the organization and ensuring a common understanding. The radiation protection of patients is also involved with the bond call for action. This was a 2012 meeting we had on the International Conference on Radiation Protection. I do not know why my slides are advancing on their own. Oh, sorry. Um, so <laughs> I, have, um, I can't talk quite that fast. So um, anyway, what is safety culture? It is the assemblance of characteristics and attitudes and organizations and individuals which establish that as an overriding priority that safety is important. What is safety culture? It's how we do things around here. It's those individual assumptions, beliefs, and attitudes about safety are a central part of an organizational safety culture that embraces a culture of health and safety. Why are we focused on safety and safety culture? Well, we know that uh, there have been events reported in radiation used in medicine, uh, that there is an opportunity to discuss the needs for both radiation safety and patient safety. And it is actually the combining of these two that is most important. The IAEA has promoted the importance of safety through standards, guides, and reports, but we still have and will have and will continue to have uh, issues with patient care and patient safety in radiation and nuclear technologies. Radiation safety culture in medicine, again, it's very important that all professionals assume responsibility for shaping the overall culture in the organization as part of their duties. In addition, leaders have special requirements to create and maintain a safe workplace. Okay, I'm done. It's quite worked. Uh, there we go. It's quite a delay from the time I hit the mouse to the time the slide changes. Uh, so what did we do? We had a consultancy meeting and a technical meeting to talk about what we needed to do to strengthen radiation safety culture. We also did a lot of research on different other industries, especially high technology industries, to see how they were uh, improving and maintaining a strong safety culture in their industry. We looked at the nuclear industry, space, aviation, and some other high uh, in engineering industries. We determined that there were 10 significant traits that were essential for a strong safety culture and that these could be applied to medical as well as the other uh, high technology uh, industries. We also needed to know how we can best influence behavior changes. And that's best done with some um, other activities other than the didactic training. Traits are a pattern of thinking, feeling, and behaving. They're more difficult to teach and learn, and it requires a modification of one's own culture, the culture of an organization, and it's influenced by the culture of a subset of people. So cultural shifts happen over time, and improvements may not be measurable for a period of time. So we know we're going to have to take uh, baby steps along the way in order to make these changes that have uh, the outcome that we hope to have.
Okay, so the uh, training material itself includes the objectives of the overall training material. We introduce each of the traits and there are 10 of those traits. We do this through case studies. We have three case studies in radiography, three in nuclear medicine and three in radiotherapy and one in water uh, worker protection. And then we use a series of questions to facilitate discussion. These questions are divided into talking about the actual case study and then how we might apply some of the lessons learned from reviewing that case study in our own institutions. So why facilitated discussion? Because it is the most likely to have changed the positive influence of a group of based behavior changes. It also has some other good uh, attributes to it because it will increase communication across, down, and up an organization. And sometimes communication is an impediment to strengthening safety culture. However, facilitators must be experienced at how to keep a positive focus on the discussion. This is not a session where we uh, air our complaints. It is an opportunity for us to look for ways to improve a situation that is at hand. And it's very important that we leave with a facilitated discussion, a wrap up of key points that can be included in our action plan uh, and can be evaluated at some future point in time. So the consultancy was held in February of 2020. We went over the material, the handbook that we had done, the 10 traits that we've done. And as a novel approach to trying to get the information out about safety culture and the need to improve it in uh, uh, radiation medicine, we held a contest uh, for digital presentations. And so these digital presentations are uh, peer reviewed uh, people. They're medical physicists, radiologists and radiographers from around the world that gave us their impression of how to improve that safety culture. We had uh, professional organizations are very key importance in getting the message out. And we wanted to make sure that we included professional organizations at the same time and they will be the carriers. It's very important that we as professionals take care of our own profession. And so hopefully we will be able to use not only IOMP, but other opportunities through professional organizations to share the message. The material is available on the IAEA website. It's uh, Radiation Safety Culture and Medicine. Currently we have a student handbook that has all 10 traits in it. It has all the questions in it. It talks about each trait and how we identify the good characteristics of that trait within your own organization. So uh, the remaining part that I'm in the process of putting up are the PowerPoint presentations. Everything else is available to you for the uh, opportunities to use this. What we hope you will do is uh, use it. Let us know. Give us a critique back. I've been getting very good comments back uh, for individuals that have used it. And you're going to see this slide again, but these are the 10 culture safety traits. And we have coordinated with other organizations such as IOMP, WHO, and IR, uh, IRPA to write another publication. And again, this is a sign of that good collaboration across many, many professional organizations and United Nations organizations that are looking to strengthen radiation safety culture and medicine. And again, just the address for the course material, and I would appreciate your feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, just a minute. Thank you uh, for the information about the IAEA material availability on the website. That's really great. I am sure uh, the participants will like to assess the material, try it and provide feedback. So IAE has the tradition of uh, providing training materials in different fields. So this is a new addition and information for the participants. So next is uh, my presentation and I will be talking on transition from radiation safety to radiation safety culture. Many of you may be diagnostic medical physicists. So I took the example of the diagnostic part. And as a diagnostic medical physicist, most people will keep a record of the patient doses, for example, in CT or in interventional procedures. Most people will tend to publish the results of the patient doses and have periodic training in programs for those involved. So, is this radiation safety or this is radiation safety culture? So let us 
look at the daily situations in life to understand the difference between radiation safety and radiation safety culture or culture as such. It gives a clear impression of lack of cleanliness. In contrast, this is a clear depiction of cleanliness, not giving seat to the needy. In some cultures, it is common to tell lie. So these three examples talking about cleanliness, seats to the needy, speaking lie, they give a sense of culture. This is disorder in traffic, orderly lane driving in traffic, no seat belt, having seat belts, speed limits and, and maintaining speed, speed limits or getting fined if not. I lived in Vienna for many years, even in midnight, if you have the red light, a pedestrian will not cross even at the midnight. Whereas in other countries, even when the green light is there for the safe, uh, for the traffic, there are people who will be. So it's a question of culture. So whether it is lane driving, seat belts, speed limit or traffic lights. So this gives an, a taste of safety culture. So imagine a situation when there is no speed limit, no monitoring, no fines, will there be culture? So that gives a sense of what is needed to bring the culture. There have to be some yardsticks, there have to be some sort of monitoring, and there has to be some rewards or punishment to inculcate the culture. So now let's come to the radiation safety culture. For example, in the hospital where I work currently in Massachusetts General Hospital, we keep on comparing our doses. For example, this is the abdominal pelvic CT dose in comparison to the national average. Similarly for the chest CT and, and there are other places where this is the data of few years when the monitoring was continuously done and seeing how things have been varying with time. This is another paper we published from our institution, Mass General Hospital, in which we had data of eight years. And we saw how the number of patients who have the air karma at reference point between two and five gray, how they were changing. And similarly, those who had more than five gray, how the number changed. So in a sense, we had this eight years data in which more than 41,000 patients were involved in the inter interventional uh, radiological procedure. And the percentage of the patients in these two bands, that is uh, two to five gray, it went down by threefold in the, during these eight years. And those between oh, more than five gray, it went down by eightfold. So does one need to define culture safety culture and radiation safety culture, or it becomes evident from these examples or the visual examples. Similarly, can, can anyone define temperature, pressure, weight, length, but we all have a feel of it. So I, I thought of taking this quote from Steve Jobs, simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. So this was a simple way of trying to explain what radiation safety culture is, and let's go a step further. For example, if one lives in Vienna, one has a sense of safety in contrast to some cities like Johannesburg, Nairobi, and many other cities. So why does one feel have a sense of safety in Vienna? Because there is absence of risk or minimal risk. Similarly, when there is no or minimal risk, it is not only on one day, but in a consistent manner as documented by statistics and over a long period, then safety culture is obviously there. So it's a minimization of risk in a consistent manner. So when you keep cleanliness, it is an action. When others also do, then it is a culture. When you drive in lane, then it is an action. When others also do, then it is a culture. So uh, if we say that our doses are X or so with respect to a reference, then it is radiation safety. 
if we say that we have been improving the doses or even maintaining it, then it becomes culture, radiation safety culture. So it's a question of temporal frame, which takes into account many actions, human resource changes, training, and that all goes into it to create the culture. How culture sets in? How much is done during non-accidental phase determines the safety culture? In medical patient safety actions are important, but integration of the radiation safety into patient safety is perhaps loose. So what we feel are important aspect, for example, through radiation safety committee or radiation safety culture, uh, education, training to different stakeholders, quality and safety committees of the hospitals, clarify, emphasize importance, participate in actions and document results. Awareness we have through IUMP been creating. Uh, we have been having sessions in various conferences organized by IUMP, whether it is the ICMP, the International Conference on Medical Physics or in World Congress. If you see the previous years, we have been having session on radiation safety culture in these conferences. We have some IUMP publications. We have published articles in that. For example, if you go to the IUMP website, there is a radiation safety culture in medicine page. Under what we do, there is a uh, radiation uh, protection and under radiation protection, then there is a radiation safety culture. And this, there is a listing of all the uh, educational workshop, which we had jointly with the organizations who are presenting today. And with that, I would like to thank you for your for your attention with a short uh, presentation. After this, I will like now to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Bernard Liguen. He is currently the president uh, for the uh, term of the IRPA uh, of 21 to 24. So he is president of the IRPA. He was previously the executive officer since 2012. He is uh, MD by uh, training and specialized in occupational medicine, also in medical biology and in radiation protection. He is senior fellow expert for radiation protection and health for the EDF group. He is chairman of the CEPN governing board, Nuclear uh, Health Physics Research Center. He received awards from American Health Physics Society, the Landor Award in 2011 and Morgan Award in 2019. He launched an IRPA international initiative on radiation protection culture. In 2008, published the IRPA doc guidance document on this subject in 2014. Let me pass on the control to you in just a minute. Okay. Yeah. No, I'll let me, I am just, yeah, remote control. Okay, now you should have the control. Just a test. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, okay. And before, okay. So, um, good morning, uh, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are. So, as uh, well presented by Madame, thank you for this uh, kind invitation. I particularly appreciate it on, be on behalf of IRPA to be with you uh, today. So, uh, concerning radiation safety culture in healthcare, uh, in introduction, I would like just to mention that IRPA has recognized the importance of establishing a, a sound radiation protection culture since 2008 and, and published a first guiding principles in 2014. It, it was a, a, a common document uh, from professionals geared towards professionals in all, uh, for all sectors from uh, nuclear industry, research uh, and, and medical area. And in terms of understanding, um, clearly uh, we, we mentioned the fact that there are no differences concerning the goal of radiation safety culture between sectors, medical, research, or nuclear industry. Uh, so at, at the end, radiation protection culture or radiation safety culture, it's exactly the same goal to achieve. As mentioned by Debbie, the radiation safety culture or radiation protection culture of any organization is defined by the attitudes, behaviors, and actions by the profession and of its stakeholders towards radiation safety. Human mistakes rarely result from neglect. 
but instead from failures in the system, processes and procedures that they work with. So all these needs have shown us that in addition to good industrial or medical practices and continuous improvement of radiation protection performance, radiation protection practices need to be embedded within a common and sustainable culture. Uh, we learn from other sectors. Just for example, in aviation area, it is essential to allow anyone with a safety concern or a perceived safety concern to raise awareness and resolve the issue before starting activities. So the notion of accountability. In nuclear industry, leadership and management are key players in enhancing radiation safety culture and chooses this as a priority. In global healthcare, there are a wide range of errors and near misses in medicines, many of which go unreported. This is embedded in a complex mix of behaviors and interaction influencing the operating environment. So this is an importance of an integrated management system and the possibility um, to register in a database all your near misses and events. That's why uh, we decided at EARPA to promote safe and appropriate use in radiation distance care through not alone, but through establishment of a joint publication with IAEA, WHO and IOMP. So this new guiding principles is focusing on how to enhance radiation safety culture in healthcare. And this guidance encompasses all uses of radiation for the improvement of health in medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, and covering activities. Um, this document has been built upon the output from six international workshops, making available the expertise and experience from stakeholders from different regions of the world. Why? Because the prime drivers on issue exist globally, but there are some cultural, social, and economic factors that influence safety culture in different parts of the world. This may result in issues that are commonalities and those are singularities. That's why we organize six workshops with different items on stakeholder engagement, on pediatric imaging, on challenging from advanced technologies, uh, on also on dialogue about guidance and tools. So this in Argentina, um, for South America, in Geneva, uh, um, at WHO headquarters uh, for Europe, uh, in Africa, uh, in Malaysia, uh, in Qatar, and finally in US, in, in San Diego. Just a few remarks or few feedback from those workshops. The first key message, uh, we observe that the recurring key issues in establishing and maintaining radiation safety culture are communication, education, and training. Uh, another point, another message, we have the opportunity to establish different SWOT analysis. And about weaknesses, lack of resources was seen as a common weaknesses uh, through the varying degrees in different ways. It could be a, a problem of fi financial resources or human resources, and threats were identified, threats were identified differently across the regions and typically included issues related to politics, local culture, including hierarchy uh, issues and lack of follow through in initiatives. That's why we have uh, this uh, fantastic opportunity with the Dream Team, as mentioned by uh, Madame Riani, to uh, publish this, um, uh, this document just now. Uh, as mentioned by Debbie, with uh, different chapters, uh, from uh, lesson learned uh, to application about tools and uh, also examples mentioned. Um, but just few messages. First message is uh, the notion that patient safety is considered to be undistinguishable from the delivery of quality health care. That's very important. Radiation safety culture is intimately connected to the quality of patient care. The second message is about organizational structure. There is no possibility 
to build a strong radiation safety culture without a strong organization. The development of a safety culture requires an organization which take account of radiation protection, but also safety, best practices, and human factors. A safety culture refers to a local environment that encourages collaboration, quality, and safety. So an organizational management uh, of radiation uh, safety must include management structure, local resource issue, training, and part of education system of an integral part of daily practice, quality initiative. So it must include radiation protection in terms of what patients expect when they come for a specific procedure, part of the overall quality process. So just to summarize about this important notion of organization, organizational structure institutionalizes how people interact with each other, how communication flows, and how relationships are defined. Just an example, in a total safety culture, employees or practitioners or patients not only feel responsible for their own safety, they feel res responsible for their peer safety and the organizational culture supports them acting on that responsibility. Another important notion is the uh, different stakeholders. I, 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 that's very important to take into account the different group of stakeholders contributing to radiation safety culture and to, to pay attention how to engage strategy because engagement strategy must be tailored to the specific target groups. The first group, all the different professional groups who either work with radiation in healthcare who are involved in the pathway of patients who utilize it for diagnosis or treatment. So, so health physicists, for example, as you are. Second group, group comprises outside bodies involved directly or indirectly with radiation safety and includes regulators, international bodies, and national professional bodies. And the last group is a group of patients, carriers, um, or um, uh, uh, also manufacturers. Another, another important point is uh, uh, tools. It's important to have a combination of optimal tools, and this is required to assess the existing level and quality of radiation safety culture not only to measure the identified criteria, but also to stimulate judgment and observation about uh, uh, radiation protection culture. The next one, if I can, is someone, yeah. The zero risk doesn't exist. Process must be fault tolerant. That's why in a strong radiation safety culture, responsibility must be understood. So leadership and managers and leadership activities must be clear. Responsibilities must be manageable. So it's important to have an integrated management system. Standard must be known. Communication strategy must be built to ensure education and awareness, particularly of the public, and also to facilitate a multidisciplinary and transparent approach to improve. Uh, sorry, there is a problem. Yeah. Uh, to uh, a multidisciplinary and transparent approach to improve culture. Early warning must be available, must learn from other mistakes. Indicators must be monitored. Audits must be conducted. Peer review must happen. Corrective action must occur. Process should be accredited. Skill and competency must be maintained and managed. And engagement with stakeholders is necessary. And finally, allocation of financial resources must be necessary. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bernard, for comprehensive coverage of various points, talking about joint workshops, which have been held during the last five years, the organizational structure, components, and stakeholders' involvement. Let me now go over to the next next slide and let me, just a minute. 
Uh, I will introduce now the next speaker, the last but not the least, Dr. Maria uh, Perez. She is physician who worked in the field of radiation protection for more than three decades. She is MD 1980 from School of Medicine from Buenos Aires University in Argentina. Uh, she completed her professional education on diagnostic imaging and radiotherapy and worked as a radiation oncologist at a public hospital till 1990. She worked at the National Atomic Energy Commission and the Nuclear Regulatory Authority subsequently. And then she moved to WHO in 2007 and she works now at the WHO headquarters in Geneva. She represents WHO at UNSCARE meetings in IAEA RASC group, in ICRP, in the European Commission Article 31 groups, and she chairs currently the Interagency Committee on Radiation Safety. Uh, and let me pass on the control to Maria now. Thank you very much. Uh... Mr. Chair, but also uh, dear Madam and dear colleagues. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I will refer to uh, our joint effort that was already described by the other uh, colleagues who preceded me. And um, it is, um, it is a, a joint effort. Uh, it started, as Madame said, several years ago, and also to support, to strengthen the radiation safety culture, supporting the implementation of the action number eight of the Bonn Call for Action. And uh, this uh, was, at the beginning, was implemented by these uh, six joint regional workshops Bernard already mentioned them, so I will be very, uh, very fast here, but just to give you the idea that our main intention was to collect feedback from the key stakeholders. And the six workshops had some similarities and specificities. You can see here the different topics that were the main topics on which we focus in each of the six regions of the world in all cases with plenary and breakout sessions to give the uh, possibility to all the stakeholders to bring their opinions and to help us frame our guidance document facing the main challenge that Madame addressed in his talk and is the challenge to understand the difference between radiation safety and radiation safety culture. We identify many regional particularities. Um, sorry, <laughs> to stop. Okay, cancel. Um, many particularities in each region, but also some commonalities. The approaches that we use in the breakout sessions we are similar. We ask uh, participants. Oh, for some reason this is moved. <laughs> this is moving. Sorry, I don't know if I can come back here. Yeah, the approaches in, were similar. We proposed the key elements. Uh, um, we asked them to let us know the key elements on radiation safety culture. In some workshops, we focus on specific modalities, as you can see, diagnostic radiology, migrating radiotherapy, nuclear medicine. And in general, we try to assign a group to discuss organizational matters. Uh, we have no time to, to, to share all the rich uh, feedback we collected, but one pledge in the first workshop in Argentina was in our hospitals, we work as a team to ensure effective use of radiation and, and uh, protect the patients and the staff. As you see, is the culture of the team. And there were many key elements identified by the stakeholders. Uh, it were presented, they were presented, uh, summarized also by Bernard. Uh, but while challenges and barriers were different among the different regions, countries, settings, low and middle income countries or high income countries, most of the key elements for maintaining a positive radiation safety culture were quite similar in the different workshops. So, we, based on that, collecting the feedback from the workshop, we developed this joint guidance document on enhancing radiation safety culture in healthcare that is already finalized, uh, not yet on the website because there are some 
final steps uh, to have them on the website, but you will receive uh, the link soon. The content of the document was presented in a way to facilitate uh, the definition, the understanding of what is radiation safety culture to reflect what was already discussed on the lessons that we can learn from safety culture in other areas, then focusing on healthcare, and then providing tools to establish, to assess, and a, a very interesting chapter I hope you will enjoy, and many of you I'm sure contributed to this chapter, is chapter seven with uh, case studies or examples of good practice. We thank all of you who sent these examples. We have so far 18 case studies, but this can be updated uh, if we can collect more examples. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, sorry, I want to go back. How can I go back? Mm. Use your uh, mouse, uh, the, the keyboard you can use. Sorry. Eh? You want to go back? Let me help you. I. Here. Next one. Okay, here. No, I want to be here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there is a key message in chapter one. I mean, again, we have no time. I picked up only a few key messages. And the key message in the chapter one is this difference between radiation safety and safety culture, that safety becomes culture when considers the organization, the individual characteristic, the attitudes that determine what Debbie also said, how we do things here. But recently we added this, that when nobody is watching, this was also coming in the workshops. <clears throat> and there are also a discussion around the stakeholders that were already mentioned, but this in this figure that will be also in the, in the publication is represented the different type of stakeholders that we actually had in our workshops. There may be many others that are relevant for safety culture, but these are the actual that we, call, uh, we had in different workshops. The diversity is, uh, is a, a strength and is a challenge. And we learned that we need to engage strategies tailored to uh, address these specific target groups. We divided the target groups arbitrarily in these four areas, like those who prefer, those who delivered the radiation, those who optimize or, or give advice, and the, the other professional groups with the patients in the middle, as you say, in the center of our work, patients and families. <clears throat> um, the, the stakeholders' views and perspectives uh, were different, and it is also in a way summarized in the document that for different groups of the stakeholders, the priorities in the radiation safety culture components were different. And this is the main reason why we definitely need to work in team works involving and engaging patients and, power, uh, and uh, families. The SWOT analysis were very uh, different also, and it was discussed also. It's interesting to see, and you see in different colors, things that were common issues and things that were very much regional issues. And you can see that what was a, a important for a region because the, the emerging new technology it was probably a strength. In other regions was a weakness, the obsolescence of other technologies. Um, we also discuss, and it's uh, something interesting, is that everyone can participate and contribute to strengthen uh, safety culture. And everyone at all levels, at international level, and this is an example, the international organizations and the professional association have a role uh, and this is what we try to do with the document. At the national level, the leadership of the governments and the regulatory authorities is important, although regulation cannot create a culture, but can facilitate and foster the culture. But culture is very local, so the main role is in the local institutions with the leadership, the responsibility embedded in the management, and with the patients, the families, and the communities uh, cross-cutting our work. Um, <clears throat> and um, the guidance document describes 10 traits that were very well described by Debbie, 
these 10 traits you see are common and we will be using these traits in future derivative products that we plan to continue uh, producing together. 10 tools for establishing and maintaining radiation safety culture. There may be many others, but we discuss at least these 10 tools and also some tools for assessing radiation safety culture. And you can see here that there are, these are tools for assessing values, attitudes, beliefs, perceptions that determine the behavior of the people. So the tools are not the classical tools we use to assess safety. You see that our surveys, observations, discussions, interviews, etc. Then <clears throat> the final considerations are uh, just to finish is that this document provides you with a framework. It recognizes the main traits, it provides the tools, but this document is the basis for all of you all over the world to develop derivative tools. We will work with you, we are happy to work with you, but this should be tailored to the local uh, conditions and the uh, local places. So I finish with this, that safety is not just the sum of the rules, policies, procedures, the building blocks are trust, communication, and definitely culture. With this, I finish saying thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, for the excellent presentation on the building blocks and apprising about the uh, new upcoming document, which should be online, I believe, within a couple of weeks. Uh, it has been almost finalized. So essentially, this joint document published through WHO and the training material provided by IAEA. So both of these resources should be excellent resources for people throughout the world. Uh, I did not have access to chat when I was projecting, so I may miss some questions. If anyone, Bernard was- There are lots of questions, I think, yeah. or comments. Yeah, one quick question I could note is uh, experts, uh, when there are none or how to deal with the situation. This is a situation which we always feel whenever we are working with less resourced countries and one has to use whatever resources are available, uh, sort of train them and do it. We have done that. When I was working at the IAEA, we had to assess the patient doses and uh, we did it. Uh, 52 countries data we published when we, there were no diagnostic medical phases, so it is possible. Uh, to do that. Uh, another, let me see, question. If, if any one of the panelists is able to spot a question, feel free to, because I have just entered the chat. Just, oh. just perhaps, just perhaps yeah. mention that uh, yeah. uh, it's very important that, of course, the question raised in the different parts of the world uh, uh, were different, but the goal to achieve was exactly the same. And that's very important, of course, for political reasons, for a uh, form of uh, resources, sometimes it's not so easy. But what we want to do is exactly the same approach in all countries. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, this uh, we wanted to set this example by uh, collaboration by four major organizations. And we have been working together for the last five years and resulting in this, uh, this document uh, is the one which is a, a joint document. And this is um, a good example of working together. Uh, of course, the document has to be published from one place. And we thought that WHO is the best uh, to have this out. So we supported WHO's efforts in bringing the document out and we are all together in that. Uh, uh, Maria, do you have any comment or Debbie, do you have any comment from the chat, looking at the chat? No, I am uh, lots of comments saying hello from different countries, which is amazing all over the world, the continents. Thank you. It's amazing. The, there is a comment here, uh, probably not exactly on safety culture, it's probably more on safety, but I will read it. It's about, um, uh, we also discuss reducing diagnostic patient dose. And the question is uh, the effect of reducing on the diagnostic outcome and that optimization is not minimization. It's really a question on safety rather than on culture. But maybe it's interesting to, to, to build up on this question to see 
the impact that uh, uh, having a strong safety culture will have on specifically on this question, which is optimization is not dose reduction, optimization is the right dose for the uh, responding the, the clinical question. And this is why I, I'm sure that in the panel, you will want to say something about that, but from my perspective in WHO, this is um, the importance of the teamwork. One of in the attributes we have uh, in the, the 10 attributes or the 10 traits of safety culture, one is the, the work process. And in the work process in uh, an imaging department, we should have a process where we will capture the uh, clinical needs with the dialogue and good communication with the referring physicians to make sure that the optimization will be exactly what this participant is saying and not just reducing the dose. So I think that although the question was about safety, safety will be the outcome, uh, uh, improving safety will be the outcome of the strengthening safety culture. Uh, but probably you have better comments on that uh, question from the audience. Yeah, Maria, as you rightly said, this is a safety rather than the culture, but I, I suppose uh, this is one example where uh, image quality and the dose has been combined, integrated, and I will refer to that, and I think that should be adequate. Any other question you can spot? I, I am reading. I will read. A comment to Bernard, uh, based on what Bernard said, somebody says, a colleague said, mm, that pleased to hear Bernard about accountability in yeah. radiation safety culture. This should be include both individual and organization and accountability, which is in the document in the book, but maybe it's, it's interesting to say something about that if you want. Well, uh, I, I would like also about the, the, these two remarks to have uh, to, to explain that when we are talking about radiation safety culture, it's definitely a multidisciplinary approach. As presented previously, when we are talking about pediatric imaging, we are not talking only about health physicists or uh, pediatricians, but we are talking also about all physicians. So it's very important to, if we want to achieve this goal of culture, is, that's why I, I wanted to, to explain that we are different stakeholders. We are all uh, actors in, this, in the system. So, so that's very, very important to take into account. So, so the last comment to say, well, it's not, uh, and when we are talking about accountability, it's exactly the same approach. It's not only my accountability. We have a, a, an important role and without accountability, there is no possibility to build a, a strong radiation safety culture. Thank you. Uh, will somebody like to comment on management, uh, senior management? Uh, is Debbie there or maybe? Yes, not? I'm here. Okay. What so, was the, what's uh, the question? Uh, senior management and uh, how to involve them and the importance of that. Uh, it is key uh, importance to have leadership or senior management involved in strengthening safety, radiation safety culture, because they hold the purse strings for resources. They also set the, the environment in many cases on how we behave and interact with each other or set by leaders or the senior management within an organization. It is uh, one of the traits is a um, accountable leader uh, taking into consideration, uh, making sure that the resources are there in order to do things safely. I would also say that there's a direct correlation between patient safety and quality assurance. And I think that this is missed sometime along the way. If we have a strong radiation safety culture, questions about optimization, justification, prevention and reduction of errors in medicine begin to diminish. So uh, we see that in an organization that has a strong, strong safety culture. We'd hope to work towards that. Um, and again, we provided some training material that we hope you will use and make it uh, part of your um, uh, in services that you have at your own institution. We can also uh, look at providing uh, some training in uh, small groups, maybe through professional organizations more so than individual countries um, to actually give the training to and train people to be facilitators. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Any other comment? Uh, there are questions, Madame. A yeah. couple of questions on the translation of this document right. to the group. Yeah. So uh, it's a good, I think, a couple of questions. And I think it's an important question that the document is not translated yet. 
but definitely translation into a, a language uh, increase the dissemination, depending the languages, maybe between 30%, 50%, 70%. So um, I, I cannot respond for the group. We need to discuss this further, but definitely I think it's something that we should consider to uh, make this really actually available uh, in, in all the, the regions. Uh, otherwise, uh, only English would be a barrier. But I don't know if you have other comments or opinions. No, no, d definitively, we, we must, we, we must uh, do that. In the uh, IRPA Guiding Principle on Radiation Protection Culture, I saw that uh, Anna Maria Bomben is with us. Uh, uh, oh, uh, we, 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 uh, we did it in, uh, also in Spanish. And uh, it's a very, very, very important. When we are talking about local culture, we must take into account that uh, uh, it's not so easy for all, all of us to speak uh, friendly English. That's also my case. And, and that's why if we have the opportunity to, um, to do it in French, in, uh, in other languages, in, in Indian, you know, please, we will do. Because this yes. document is not for us, it's for you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, low resource setting. Uh, anyone would like to give comment, uh, Maria? Of course, yeah, definitely, because I can see different questions. Uh, they are happy to see the collaborative work and want to see how to support the implementation, mostly in low resource settings. So uh, it, it was really a great teamwork, uh, as Madame, you said, the, 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 the dream team, because we work very nicely together, excellently. So I think we should continue and to support the implementation, we should uh, conduct activities together. Debbie, in, with the new document that she published, the training material is, is a perfect example of how we can go to low and uh, middle income countries to disseminate uh, the uh, radiation safety culture attributes, but also at the same time disseminate the book. So I think this is something that we will consider. Uh, for regional activities, but probably maybe some experience at country level. Sometimes it's difficult for us to reach to each country, but at least regional and sub-regions will be probably at least in our consideration in WHO to disseminate. Thank you. Uh, A major issue is underdeveloped countries. So underdeveloped countries is the inability of the national organization to enforce the radiation safety rules and their inability to handle accidental exposure. Yeah, this is a continuous issue which requires attention of uh, people to create awareness. And that is where we all uh, have a role to play in our wherever uh, people are. Whatever help you need from international sources, we are able to give that in terms of uh, uh, provisions in the standards, provisions in the national uh, guidance. We are always happy to provide that, but at the ground level, uh, uh, everybody has to contribute. Uh, any any sub supplementation from the panelists? If not, we are just uh, to be respectful of the time. We yeah. are reaching the time and everyone has some other meetings. Uh, most of the panelists have uh, another meeting immediately following. So we will prefer to finish well in time. I think I should announce the next webinar on 23rd February. Let me project that. Uh, the next webinar will be on 23rd February. It is a joint webinar of IUMP with IAA and the CIRSE, the Cardiovascular and Interventional Radiation Society of Europe. And the topic is what is new in understanding radiation risks for patients in interventional procedures. So this is the webinar. You, uh, you will find information on the IUMP website. Uh, the webinar will be hosted by IAA, unlike the current one uh, where IUMP was the host. So this next webinar will be hosted by IAA and uh, other organizations are cooperating with that. And we wish to 
thank you for your presentation, uh, for your participation today. And I wish to thank all the panelists for the wonderful presentations they made and sharing their knowledge and talking about the cooperative actions which we have taken during the last so many years. Thank you very much. Thank you all participants and have a wonderful time. Have a good time. All the best. Bye bye. Bye bye to everybody. Thank you, Madam, and to the IOMB for having organized this. Thank you. Thank